Dr. Wellens. Okay, well, hello everybody. I'm so happy you're able to join us tonight. We do have a very interesting uh, couple of lectures planned for you. I am part of the foot and ankle team at Rothman Orthopedics, and I deal with a lot of athletes, a lot of runners. So tonight, I would like to go over some of the common running injuries that I encounter. However, before I do that, I want to go over some basic things about foot type and foot position. Because in order to prevent these injuries, it's important to have an understanding of those things. So let's go to our next slide. Now, as far as common causes of foot and ankle injuries in runners, one of the most common problems I see when patients come in is that they're not wearing the appropriate shoe for their foot type. In addition, inadequate arch support also can promote injuries to occur. We'll also talk a little about overuse and overtraining. And then of course, uneven terrain. No matter what, if you're running outside and you're gonna hit some uneven sidewalk or a divot in the grass or, or a trail run, inevitably you do have that chance of injuring yourself. Now, first I would like to go over the three uh, foot types that we, we generally assess. The rectus foot is also considered the normal foot. So this gives you an idea of a picture of a normal arch. There's a nice little contour here in the midfoot and the toes are in good position. Pes planus is commonly known as the flat foot deformity. In my practice, patients are coming in because they're having a foot issue. The vast majority of patients I see do have a flat foot deformity that is contributing to their issues with sports. And then the other foot type, which is considered more rare, is pes cavus, and that is that high arch foot type. Some people do have the, the foot type just because they do. This is also seen in people with neuromuscular disorders as well. So we do not encounter the pes cavus foot type quite as often as the, the flat foot deformity. Now it's really important to understand foot position because as athletes and runners, you want to make sure that you understand your foot type for when you go to purchase your running shoes. And also to consider whether or not you're going to need an arch support in your shoe. The middle slide here is considered the neutral foot type. This is the ideal foot type. During running cycle, it is normal to have a little bit of pronation because that is how your foot adjusts to uneven terrain and just to the, the ground reactive forces as your foot is hitting that ground. That allows you to absorb shock and progress onto your next step. So on, on this slide over here, you'll see pronation. In this particular case, this is over pronation. This is a person with a flat foot. So in this foot position, it is gonna leave you prone to multiple issues with the foot and ankle, which we will go over shortly. So this is a common occurrence in my practice for patients to come in with this flat foot deformity and not realize that they're really over pronators. As I said earlier, you also have that cavus foot type or that high arch. Those patients tend to supinate where they're in a position of limited flexibility, poor shock absorption, and it also puts them at risk for potential ankle sprains. So again, this would be the supinated foot type, which we don't see quite as, as often as the other two. Now, if you look at this foot here, this person is sitting in the chair as we took this picture. You can see the nice contour of the arch, and you would look at this foot and think, wow, this person is a rectus foot type, a normal foot. However, when you're assessing your foot type, it's not when you're sitting in the chair, it's when you're standing up. So this patient, in fact, has a flat foot deformity. 
while they have a very nice arch when they're sitting in the chair, as soon as they stand up, they're flat as a pancake. Now, I've had many patients come in and they're shocked when I tell them they have a flat foot. And as they're sitting there on the exam table, they're like, but doctor, look at my foot, I have a nice arch. And I said, yes, you do when you're sitting on the table. But as soon as you stand up, that arch collapses and you have a flat foot deformity. So let's talk about some sneaker options because this is important when you're a runner. You wanna make sure you're in the proper shoe for your foot type. As I said earlier, so many of the injuries that I see are caused by people not running in the appropriate shoe and not having enough support in their shoes. With that flat foot type, we recommend stability sneakers. You're looking at a shoe with a stable sole and limited flexibility. Now, what the materials in a stability shoe do is they reduce that pronation because they have firmer material, materials in the insole, particularly on that inner arch. That's gonna capture you from over pronating. They should also have a firm heel counter. So what I mean when I say that is if you take the sneaker and you, you put your hand at the back of the heel, if you're able to crush that heel, that is not a firm heel counter. You, you would want a shoe that when you take that heel and you squeeze on it, it stays, it doesn't crush. It's, it's firm, it's solid, and it's gonna grip the back of your heel and hold it in good position. So again, they're, they are the primary qualities of a stability shoe. Now, as far as brands, everybody's foot is a little different. Some people have wider feet, some people have more narrow feet, and some people just have different preferences. So you really need to research it and you need to physically try on these different shoes. So if you go on the various websites, whether it be Asics or Brooks or New Balance or Saucony or any of the other brands, they usually will explain to you, okay, these are stability shoes and they'll give you some options. So it is important to consider that when you're purchasing your sneakers. Now, when we're talking about either the rectus foot, which was that normal foot and the high arch foot or that pes cavus, you're going to gravitate towards neutral shoes. In a neutral shoe, the weight is going to be distributed more evenly throughout the shoe. And most of that cushioning, you're going to find more so in the heel. You will also have extra cushion along the outside of the shoe. And a neutral shoe does tend to be more flexible than a stability shoe. However, it's still going to have adequate stability to allow you to run appropriately and still protect your joints. Now, as I, I said earlier, with that supinated foot or that pes cavus foot, those patients are prone to lateral ankle sprains or rolling the outside portion of the ankle when they run. So again, if the neutral shoe is built appropriately, it should have a little extra on the outside to help try to push you as close to neutral as possible. And, and that's definitely our goal there. And again, if you go on the manufacturer websites, they'll also uh, show you what are their neutral shoes for, for these rectus and high arch foot types. So that brings us on to the topic of orthotics. Now, I'm a huge advocate of orthotics for patients who need them. Again, a vast majority of my patients who come in are suffering from overpronation, and in those cases, orthotics can be a huge, huge help. I, before the lecture, we received well over 100 questions. So during this lecture, I'm trying to incorporate as many of the answers as I can. And some of the questions were in regards to orthotics. And one of the questions I found interesting was, is there a way to strengthen your foot so that you no longer need orthotics? And this is the answer I, I give to my patients. There are different schools of thought on this. I'm looking at it from a structural standpoint as far as the foot sits in relationship to the ground. And I use this analogy of looking at a sofa. This is gonna sound a little crazy at first, but just follow along with me. If you look at a sofa, 
the frame of a sofa is built of wood and metal. And, and that frame is supposed to keep that couch firm and sturdy. And then you have the cushions that sit on that sofa frame and the materials that cover it. Well, if you have a sofa frame that's going to sag, you could have the strongest, firmest cushions in the world. But that sagging frame is still going to prevent those strong cushions from staying straight. They're going to sag along with the frame. So that's how you have to look at your foot. The frame of your foot is the skeleton. You cannot change the skeleton. The only way to change skeletal deformity is to do bone surgery. So you have to work with your foot type. So the skeleton is your frame. And the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments are like those cushions and materials that sit on the outside of the frame. So you may have the strongest muscles in the world in your feet, but if you have a sagging skeleton, it doesn't matter. It's, they're still gonna sag. The only way to eliminate that sagging is with an orthotic device, in addition to the appropriate shoe to put it into. On this slide here on my left, these are the prefabricated medical grade orthotics that we offer in the office. And on the right, these are custom designed uh, orthotics. They are much more expensive, but they are custom made just for you. We cast your feet with plaster, we send them to the lab, I write the prescription with all of the specifications on what you need based on your foot type and your measurements. And then the lab makes them and sends them back. And the vast majority of the patients, particularly my athletes who have these issues, tend to do very well with the orthotics inside the appropriate shoe for their foot type. So now I want to go into some of the common medical issues I run into with my runners and, and go over some of the specifics. So one of the most common things I see is shin splints. Patients come in and they're like, oh, geez, I started running. Um, I started increasing my mileage and I got this terrible pain on the front of my foot. So the medical name for it is medial tibial stress syndrome. So what is it? Well, when you're looking at the leg here, in your leg, the main weight-bearing bone is the tibia. And this is the bottom part of the tibia that helps form your ankle joint. On the outside here, this is the outside of your ankle, this is the fibula, and this is the long bone that acts as a strut. If you go to the inside portion of the tibia, there's a large muscle belly that attaches there, and the tendon of that muscle goes directly into the foot. This muscle is called the tibialis anterior muscle. So what shin splints essentially are is micro tears of this muscle belly away from the bone. And in severe cases, you can develop stress fractures. The most common place that I see this in is over pronators. These are runners who are running in the wrong shoes and do not have adequate arch support. I've also seen it in people who are overtraining. They're just pushing themselves too hard, too fast. The body can't keep up. Treatment for shin splints, again, I'm a huge advocate of orthotics. I do think that in, in patients with shin splints, I've seen them make massive differences and they can get back to running at, at their previous shin splint level, including marathons. Physical therapy is usually also needed to help calm down the inflammation and also work with the runner on their running technique and their stride because those things can certainly influence the formation of shin splits. And of course, traditional treatments for the symptoms such as ice and NSAIDs are very good. And in very severe cases, we will temporarily immobilize a patient in a boot just to help things settle down. If I'm concerned about the possibility of an underlying stress fracture, I will send you for an MRI. But again, you want to act quickly when shin splints start because if they become chronic, they are very difficult to get rid of. So the next uh, topic we're going to talk about is heel pain. There's two general sites of heel pain. You're either going to 
experience Achilles tendonitis, and here's your Achilles tendon right here. The Achilles tendon is the tendon that attaches your calf muscles to your heel bone. It's a very powerful tendon and it can become very inflamed. And when it comes to Achilles tendonitis, you wanna jump on it early. The longer it lingers, the harder it is to get rid of. Plantar fasciitis is the other cause of heel pain. The plantar fascia is a large band of tissue that runs along the bottom of the foot. It attaches here at the heel and it goes to the toes. Its job is to essentially support your arch. Right at the insertion to the heel bone is a common spot of inflammation, which is plantar fasciitis. So again, you really want to try to recognize these issues early and jump on them early to treat them so they do not become chronic issues. Now, one of the common culprits in heel pain, both the Achilles and the plantar fascia, is something we call equinus. And what equinus is, is tight calves. Some people just have them, it's the way you're made. However, if you don't address it through aggressive stretching, it can be something that's going to put a lot of stress on these structures and, and leave you in a lot of pain. So it is important that we address that. Again, going back to my overpronators, common, common problems in my overpronators. So again, that's why it's so important to be in the appropriate shoe and have appropriate arch support. And those treatments will include the orthotics, physical therapy, ice, and steads, immobilization in severe cases. The vast majority of my patients will respond to these treatments. There is a small percentage that does not. And when they don't, I do offer a minimally invasive surgical procedure called the 10X procedure. And that is done under local anesthesia. And essentially what I do is under ultrasound, I make a very small incision once the area is numb. And I use a special 10X probe to treat those areas of inflamed tissue and allow the body to regenerate healthy new tissue. And for the patients that do undergo the procedure, the vast majority do very well with that procedure. So again, it's generally a last resort. Most patients will respond to conservative treatment and the key is recognizing it and addressing it early. Stress fracture is another common problem that I see. This is generally an overuse injury and I see it so many times in patients wearing inappropriate shoes for their foot type. I've seen it in overpronators. I've seen it in patients with that high arched foot. There's too much stress in these bones. They can't, cannot take the load and over time the bone starts to break down. Um, you can see the two arrows pointing here. This is the third metatarsal. This halo here is representative of a stress fracture. So it is something that will absolutely require at least six weeks of immobilization, if not longer. And also you need to correct the cause. You need to understand why it happened, whether it was the shoes, whether it was inadequate support. Bone density is another issue. One of the questions I received uh, was regarding nutrition in runners. From an orthopedic standpoint, it's all about bone density. So, if you're someone who has density issues, by all means, you should be considering calcium with vitamin D supplements. If you have any family history of osteopenia or osteoporosis, you should certainly have that worked up. And in some cases, it does require prescription medication, and it is something you can certainly work with your primary on. But stress fractures if they're not treated, will result in full breakdown of the bone and you will have a complete fracture entirely through the bone. And if that displaces, in some cases, it can lead to surgery. So definitely needs to be taken seriously. Some of the clinical signs that you might be developing a stress fracture, and the most common area I do see them in is the metatarsals. You can also get them in the, the leg, like we talked about earlier with the tibia. I've even, even seen them in the fibula and also the, the calcaneus, which is the heel bone. The, the clinical signs would be 
sudden increase in pain in a local area, heat, redness, and swelling. They're all signs of a stress fracture. If you have those, certainly come in for evaluation as soon as possible. And then we have our good old ankle sprain. <laughs> um, so many ankle sprains happen. Honestly, a lot of times, this is not necessarily a foot type uh, issue or a, a shoe type issue. It's just an accident. Just running, you hit an acorn, you, you slip off a curb, your ankle's gonna roll. Um, I do also see these though in that high arch or that pes cavus foot type, like I said earlier, because you just don't have that shock absorption ability back here. So it's much more easier for you to roll that ankle. Um, I have also seen it in some patients with improper shoes. So the traditional treatments for ankle sprains are rice, which is rest, ice, compression, and elevation, depending on the severity of the ankle sprain. We're either going to look at a brace or a boot for temporary immobilization. And then I'm a huge advocate, especially in my athletic population, again, for physical therapy. I don't want you to become a chronic ankle sprainer. I want to eliminate that possibility. So physical therapy is really important in helping with that. In very rare cases, if you sustain an ankle sprain and then you do end up with chronic instability, it does require surgical reconstruction of the ligaments. The vast majority of patients do not need that and can be treated successfully with surgery. I mean, excuse me, with conservative treatment. It's rare, you know, that we really have to go the surgical route. So that is the basics for foot and ankle injuries for runners. Um, again, uh, as Casey said earlier, at the end, you can certainly type in any questions you have in the chat box. And again, I'm, I'm happy to, to see you if you ever need me. I'm in the Northeast Philadelphia office on Mondays, and I'm in Center City Tuesdays through Fridays. And I, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. Casey, shall I stop share? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Wellens. Yeah, if you could stop this um, presentation and we'll let Matt jump on. Great presentation, by the way. Oh, thank you. We have a couple questions coming in, but we'll wait to the end because Matt may answer some. Absolutely. Matt, you're on mute. Yep. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wellens, for taking the time to talk about the injuries, uh, running injuries, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, as Tashay mentioned, I'm Matt Brody. I work at Novacare Rehabilitation. My clinic is located down on South Broad Street. So as a marathon runner, I understand the importance of taking care of your body and properly training so that you can endure uh, those long runs. And so this is really why I love working with runners. And so. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about running assessments and then the biomechanics that I typically see during these assessments. So uh, when you come to my clinic, uh, I perform these, these uh, video assessments using a running specific app and we'll video you from multiple angles um, and then break down your mechanics in slow motion so that we can really uh, work on the different um, abnormalities that I see. I'll also run through a quick musculoskeletal screen uh, just to see if there's any big overlying uh, strength deficits. So some of the big things that I take a look at when I'm performing these running assessments would be step rate. So how many steps are you taking per minute? Your striking pattern, so are you landing on your heel, your midfoot, or your forefoot? Your step width, so how far apart or how close together are your legs landing? Your body's overall ability to absorb impact and shock from the ground your lower extremity motor control. So are you able to control your hips, your pelvis, your knees and your ankles, and then just overall running efficiency um, so that you can maintain proper efficiency when running long distances or just trying to break a personal record. So I'm gonna discuss just a few um, abnormalities that I commonly see. And so the first one is overstriding. And so this occurs when your foot lands too far in front of your center of mass uh, or your body's trunk. And so that can increase um, your, your vertical displacement or essentially how much your body moves up and down. And you can see this when someone uh, bounces up and down as they run. And um, this can also 
Overstriding can also lead to increased force through your knee. And so a higher amount of force and load through your knee can lead to a greater risk of injury. Additionally, overstriding um, increases uh, your, uh, your braking impulse, so which means it decreases your momentum. So when you run, your Achilles tendon acts as a spring to propel you onto your next step. But when you overstride, you take away that spring effect. So essentially, you're decreasing uh, your running efficiency and while also uh, slowing down your speed. And so I wanted to list just a few um, associated injuries with overstriding. Uh, they include patellofemoral pain syndrome or just global general knee pain, iliotibial band syndrome, tibial stress fractures, hamstring strains, and interior exertional compartment syndrome. Uh, the next common abnormality that I see is narrow step width. And so that's visualized uh, when you see someone with a crossover running pattern. Um, so in this picture, you can see the runner's left foot is landing across that red midline, uh, which represents the middle of her body. And so uh, when you see someone with a, a narrow step width, uh, there typically isn't too much space in between their knees. Mechanically, we wanna see like a, a visible knee window. So we want there to be some space in between their knees. And, um, and so when you, when you have someone uh, with a narrow step width pattern, uh, there's typically excessive pronation, which Dr. Wellens touched on. Um, and so basically you're having the majority of your weight on the inner portion of your foot, which you can see um, the runner has pretty excessive pronation in this picture. And this running pattern is pretty inefficient uh, due to just it leading to excessive rotation of your trunk, your pelvis, and your hips. And then if you take a look at this picture here, uh, the runner uh, is able to keep her foot along the side of the midline. And then there's also a good amount of space in between her knees. So some associated injuries with a narrow step width include increased iliotibial band strains and then tibial stress fractures. And then the third abnormality that I typically see is called medial collapse. And this, is, uh, this occurs when the hip that's in the air drops down and then the knee that's on the ground goes inward, which is known as dynamic valgus. And then there's also excessive pronation, which we've been talking about. Um, so medial collapse can occur for a handful of different reasons. Um, a few of them just include poor control of your legs in multiple planes of motion, uh, poor recruitment of your hip muscles, or just weak hip abductor muscles, uh, such as the gluteus medius, which plays a huge role in hip stability. So in this picture, you can see the runner's hip, the left hip drops down, then the right knee is going inward. And then she also has some uh, pronation, over pronation on her right foot. And so I wanted to show you just a close up picture of excessive pronation. Um, and so you can see that uh, in this runner, her ankle collapses inward, which uh, as we've been talking about, makes it a lot harder for your foot to absorb the impact and shock from the ground. And so when we perform these running assessments, uh, we really like to take a look at the entire leg from the pelvis to the hip to the knee uh, to the ankle because something as subtle and small as this overpronation can play a huge role throughout the entire body. And then here are some injuries uh, associated with medial collapse. They include iliotibial band syndrome, the uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome, gluteal tendinopathies, and tibial stress fractures. In the case of this runner uh, where her knee is going inwards, she most likely would have pain along the outer aspect of her knee. So after we perform these running assessments, what do we do with all this information? So following the video assessment, I'm able to identify a runner's mechanical abnormalities, which I've previously discussed. Uh, but then from there, my job is to identify why are these abnormalities occurring in the first place? And so I'll develop a unique plan to improve your specific mechanics. And that typically includes a running specific strengthening program that addresses strength in multiple planes of motion, um, reteaching your, your body how to um, move properly, reteaching your muscles how to fire properly, and then also just how to properly cross train, whether you're also swimming, biking, or just lifting weights. It's really important that you, that you do cross train, but that you cross train properly. And so after that, uh, we'll develop a, a gradual return to run program if you're injured, and then also discuss with you proper education on load management 
or we'll construct a training program uh, for a future race based on your ultimate goals, whether that's to uh, finish a 5K, run a half marathon, marathon, or just beat your personal record. So I truly believe that one of the best ways to decrease the likelihood of future injuries is to have a well-designed, unique program that's made specifically for you. So I wanted to just show you uh, some success stories of people who have come in for running assessments. And so on the left side, this runner had a narrow step width. You can see that her foot is going across the midline and you really can't see too much space uh, between her knees. So then after a few uh, ther physical therapy sessions, we're able to correct her mechanics where we got her to the point where her left foot landed on the proper side of the midline. And then you can also see a good amount of space in between her knees. So she has that visible knee window. And then in this photo um, on the left side, you can see this runner had medial collapse where her left hip was dropping down, right knee was going inward. And then she also had that excessive pronation on the right side. Um, and then with cueing and, and working um, and just trying to get her to think about her mechanics, uh, we were able to get her to correct these mechanics. So on the right side, uh, you can see that, uh, that her hips are level and then her left foot, knee and hip are all in line. And so I've listed my contact information here. Um, that's my, this is the clinic's phone number and that's my personal email. Um, and we also have a few other physical therapists in the city and then surrounding area who perform these running assessments. But if you have any questions at all about running assessments or just running in general, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always more than happy to talk about running. Um, and then I know uh, we received a handful of questions um, that we tried to include in our presentations. There were a few that didn't specifically pertain to the information that I presented, but I still just wanted to touch on. A number of people asked about um, treating meniscus injuries. And so although they don't, meniscus injuries don't often occur strictly from running, they can still have a huge impact on your ability to run. And so some, I, I usually suggest some typical um, general strengthening in terms of quad strengthening and glute strengthening for these uh, meniscus injuries. However, this is someone who I would really wanna see for a one-on-one -on -one evaluation, uh, just so I could see how they're running and then really develop a unique plan uh, just for them so that I can, I can really get to the bottom of what their issue is and then kind of treat the exact issue that we have at hand. And then another typical um, or another common question that we had was, is running bad for your joints and bones? And so it's actually been shown that uh, being overweight is a greater risk factor for joint pain than your overall mileage, as long as there wasn't a previous injury. And so if someone is overweight, it could definitely be beneficial to still do some kind of aerobic exercise, not necessarily running at that exact time, but something like biking or swimming where it's a little bit low impact uh, just to reduce the strain in your joints. And then um, a few people also mentioned, how do you prevent injury in the aging runner? And so maintaining proper weight is really a great way to, to lower that risk of injury as we get older. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me. I'm gonna send it back to Casey and Tasha for any other questions. Great, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dr. Wellens. You both um, spoke wonderfully on this subject. There are a couple of questions that have come through. If anybody else has questions and wants to submit um, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, please go ahead and do so. I am gonna just put it out there. If the questions get too personal, we may have to skip them, so try and keep them a little bit generic. Um, but we'll go with the first one. What exercises do you recommend before and after a run to help recover and avoid foot and ankle injury? Matt, that might be for you. Um, yeah, so typically um, with, with any kind of, uh, with most ankle injuries, I um, prescribe a lot of proprioceptive training um, along with, along with neuro, like, uh, just general strengthening as well. It depends, it truly does, does depend on the ligaments that are lax, whether it's along the medial aspect, the, the inside or the outside aspects. So I would really need to examine you to see which, uh, what area you're having issues with, but those would be typical exercises that I would work on. Great. Dr. Wellens, what are your thoughts on shockwave EPAT treatments? Um, 
the shockwave therapy, uh, I, I guess I'm assuming they're talking more in line with uh, Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis. I have administered them in the past. I have not done them in several years. Personally, I had mixed results with them, so I did get away from shockwave therapy. Um, I've had great success with 10X procedure for patients who failed traditional conservative treatments. Okay. Um, this is a toss up, either one of you could take it. How do you determine what is the best running shoe for you? I've been told that I overpronate and have gotten new shoes after being assessed at running at a running store, but continue to experience tightness tightness in the Achilles and calves. Actually, Dr. Wellens, I know you. Yeah. So um, early on in the lecture, I did talk about for people who overpronate, you definitely want a stability shoe. That's going to help eliminate or, or significantly reduce the overpronation. However that won't address the tightness in the calves or the plantar fascia. That requires daily stretching exercises and in some case, physical therapy to help reduce that tightness. Uh, the, that tight calf muscle, medically we know as equinus, and equinus is a very deforming force in the foot. So it is very important to eliminate as much of that calf tightness as you can. When your calf muscle is too tight, your ankle joint cannot move through its normal full range of motion. It puts so much stress on it. So what ends up happening is when the ankle joint motion is, is limited, it puts the stress down into the midfoot. And then your midfoot starts to collapse. You overpronate even more and it also stresses your plantar fascia. So it's all part of that kinetic chain. Um, and just along those lines for a running shoe, would you recommend a soft or a hard sole? For an overpronator, you need a stability uh, shoe, and this that is a is different important. question. Sorry. Oh, it's a different question. Yeah. So no uh, background. Okay. So earlier on in the lecture, I, for patients who overpronate have that flatter foot type, you want a stability shoe. You want a firm sole. You do not want a lot of flexibility. For someone who is um, what we consider the rectus or normal foot type or that high arch, you go towards a neutral shoe, which will give you a little more flexibility, a little more cushion, will still give you support, but will also help you absorb shock. Great. Um, this person has done steroid shots, shockway, EPAT, PT for a year. They've lowered mileage, cross training, and still struggling with plantar fasciitis. What else would you recommend at that point? Um, generally, for that patient, they would certainly be a potential candidate for the 10X procedure. Um, I have had many patients sent to me by other providers who have failed conservative treatment. Uh, generally, I do uh, uh, either require an, like, or I will order an MRI or an ultrasound to assess the soft tissue structures um, and get a feel for what's going on in there. And if it is indeed um, a, a thick plantar fascia with chronic inflammation, um, the vast majority of patients do respond well to the 10X procedure. Great. Next question, um, Dr. Wellens, do you believe all over pronation problems are structural or do you believe some could be a strength issue? Stru I, I'm of the school of structural. Um, it all starts with what is the skeletal structure of your foot the skeletal structure of your foot's gonna dictate how your foot's gonna contact the ground. So no, I, I don't think it is a strength issue. Okay. How do you tell the difference between a bone, muscle, or tendon injury? Well, the very, whenever I examine a patient, the, the two most important components are a thorough history and a very thorough physical examination. I use x-rays, MRIs, ultrasounds, CAT scans as additional diagnostic information. But the vast majority of the time, if you do a, a good history and a thorough exam, you can get a feel for what structure is most likely involved. Okay. Next question, does insurance cover 10X? Can it be used on hip, leg, tendon? Yes, 10X is, uh, it's a surgical procedure, so it is, a covered, it is covered by insurance 
everybody's insurance is different. So patients do have different surgical deductibles. Um, I, my practice is specific for foot and ankle, but yes, you can use it in other parts of the body. My, some of my sports medicine colleagues do it on elbow, um, hip, the, the other areas. Okay. Um, and how long is the recovery for 10X? So it, after the procedure, it's the same day in and out procedure. It's done under straight local. You will be in a boot for two weeks. After the two weeks, you see me for follow-up. If you're doing well, I get you out of the boot. I put you into a sneaker. You can do low impact activities like walking, no high impact r running or jumping. I see you four weeks later after that, which is six weeks after the procedure. And then we base return to full activity um, on your uh, condition at that time. A small percentage of patients do require some additional physical therapy at that six week mark. In my experience, the large majority do not. Okay. Um, what is the difference between 10X and 10JET? So 10X was evolved from the technology based on cataract surgery. So it uses ultrasonic energy to emulsify or essentially melt the dise diseased tissue. 10JET, which I don't offer, is using high energy water injected into the area to uh, break up the diseased tissue. I've had great success with the 10X and that's what I'm comfortable using and my patients have done well with it. So that's generally what I offer at this point. Okay. This question is probably from Matt. Are running assessments covered by insurance? Yeah, so if you uh, come in with a physical therapy prescription, um, then yes, it would be covered under your insurance um, during your initial evaluation. Um, of, yeah, otherwise, typically, we, um, you can do like a self-pay as well. Okay. Um, I, and then also, Matt, which part of the foot or sole should touch the ground first while running versus walking? Um, so it really depends on on if you have an injury or not. If you have an injury, um, I'm more inclined to change up where you do land on your foot. If you're landing on your heel, then we might change it to midfoot or forefoot. Um, if you're really not having a ton of pain landing on your heel, then I'm less inclined to change where you land on the foot. Um, when you're walking, typically you wanna land um, naturally on, on the heel and have that rolling effect. Okay. Dr. Wellens, what if you only overpronate on one side? Would you get an orthotic on just that one side? Um, no, you would want to get a pair of orthotics and it, the orthotics are made unique for foot. So if I have a patient who overpronates on one side and they're in neutral position on the other, we'll give you a pair of orthotics so your, your limb length is the same, but I'll be adding different correction on the overpronating side and I'll keep the non-pronating side neutral. Okay, um, and this is the last question. It's for Matt. What running app do you use? Um, so I personally use, typically use Huddle. I've also used Dartfish. Um, that one's a little bit more in depth, um, but I know a lot of people use Slope Pro and they, and they uh, swear by it. I personally just prefer the other two. Um, I feel like they, they are really detailed and I'm able to get out of everything that I need to from those. Okay, um, two more questions came in. Do you know how insurance can pay for a subscription to home treadmills, uh, visor subscription? I don't know. No. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, and then what can I do to prevent perineal tendinitis? I get it after walking, but have no issues while running. Um, so for perineal tendonitis, again, I most commonly see that in my overpronators. The reason why is when you overpronate, you, you're, you tend to have that more flexible flat foot. The perineals want to try to correct you so they consistently overfire. fire. Um, now, when you're walking versus running, you, you're certainly hitting the ground in a different um, way. 
um, and Matt, you can chime in on this too. It, it would be my suspicion that if you're getting the perineal tendonitis when you're when you're running, but not when you're walking, my guess in running you're either a midfoot to forefoot striker versus a heel striker, and then when you're walking you're more of a heel striker. I mean, with I guess that that would make sense to me biomechanically. Yep, that's typically what I see as well. Yeah. So in order to prevent that. Um, again, you got to go back to the basics. Are you in the right shoe? Do you have appropriate arch support? What's your foot type? And, and that's how we can work on preventing the, the perineal tendonitis. It does also occur in the cavus foot too, because again, with that high arch foot, they're constantly supinating or, or, or rolling out. So that in itself puts excessive stress on the perineals as well. Sometimes we have to do an orthotic and add what we call lateral flange to try to force you into a slight bit of pronation to take the, the stress off those perineal tendons. Great. Um, I have hallux valgus problems. What recommendations do you have for that? And what is, and when is it critical to have surgery done on it? So hallux valgus, also known as bunions, um, can be treated either conservatively or surgically. Conservative treatments consist of shoes with a wider toe box, enough shock absorption and support. Again, going back to that pronated flat foot type, that's where we're most commonly seeing the bunions. So you want to make sure you're in a more structured shoe with appropriate arch support. Symptomatic relief can include ice or heat, if you're able to take an anti-inflammatory or topical medications. Surgery is indicated when you have failed all conservative treatments and you get to that point where you're like, you know what, I can't take this anymore. I can't do what I wanna do, it hurts every day. It's an individual choice because it is an elective surgery. So you decide when you're ready for it. Um, but bunions are a structural bony deformity and they most commonly do require some type of cut in the bone and shifting of the bone in order to correct it. Great, thank you. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Wellens. Thank you, Matt, for joining us um, or giving this presentation tonight. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Just as a reminder, if you do want to make an appointment with Dr. Wellens, that phone number is 215. 320-8211. She sees patients in Center City, Philadelphia and the Northeast. And if you would like to make an appointment with Matt Brody at NovaCare, you can give them a call at 1-800-770-6682. Um, you also have an email from us. So if you ever have any other questions following this presentation, feel free to reach out at any time. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Mm -hmm.